Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. One for Ukraine, one for Israel, one for Taiwan, then another piece of legislation to bring in things like the Repo Act, maybe TikTok, all of this foreign policy. Remember the emergency funding request at the end of last year that already passed the Senate. This is the House's attempt to try to do all of this through a series of votes. Pretty amazing that we're not there yet, because, again, we're talking about a Saturday vote, and that's just the House. In the Senate, hold on, J.D. Vance just tweeted, Rumored course of action in the House. Combined Ukraine and Israel aid with other Biden boondoggles. Send it all to the Senate as a combined package. (laughs) Then let the House vote on a fake border security package that has no chance. He calls it betrayal and stupid politics to boot. Mike Dorning joins us to clear a path here to maybe some truth. Helping to edit our coverage in Washington from Capitol Hill to our bureau here downtown dc it's good to see you mike great Um, to be here we are expecting something before this day is out correct yes um speaker johnson just sent a text to all the members which our reporters on the hill quickly saw outlining the conditions that would be in the bill and we expect to have text imminently so that means all these meetings mike johnson's been having with conservative republicans who are upset with him not to mention the motion to vacate hanging over his head with now two names on it. He's actually holding the line on his plan that he unveiled Sunday night. Yeah, uh, he had said he was going to release this plan yesterday. So everyone was wondering, you know, it dragged on into the night and in the morning we didn't get it. And we knew that hardliners were furious with him and trying to talk him out of it. But in the end, you know, just before noon today, he stuck with it and said, I'm going to press forward with my plan. So now we have to watch the hardliners and see how they react. We have, as you mentioned, two hardliners that had already said they would, you know, participate in a coup attempt and try to overthrow him. Um, But they need to get more hardliners into the overthrow. Democrats, meanwhile, have been saying that if the Ukraine aid plan essentially does the same thing as the Senate version of the bill, and maybe has a few other minor tweaks, Mm -hmm. they would, at least for the time being, back Johnson. So we still haven't seen the exact um, provisions in the bill. The Democrats are waiting for that. Um, But the Democratic cavalry might save him at least temporarily if this bill meets some conditions. So this is just a brutal mission for Tom Emmer, the majority whip, right? You're not just whipping one, you're whipping four bills now, and everybody's angry at somebody. Do we believe that they are counting votes to pass them? Uh, Yes, certainly they are counting votes to pass them. But actually, part of the reason they broke them up into separate bills was Uh to make it easier to get the bills passed. You can have Ukraine aid that all the Democratic progressives will go along with, Mm -hmm. while the ultra-conservatives can all vote against it. And then you can have Israel aid that the Democratic progressives won't vote yeah, for because sure. it doesn't require rules, but all the ultra conservatives the will vote for it. splitting them up, but yeah. there's a war room somewhere with now oh, four for sure, bills yeah. on it, and this guy's got to be up all night. It's a massive jigsaw puzzle. But they, they did that to make it easier. Understood. So how, though, the, stitching it back together, the Frankenstein strategy, as I've been calling it, could be the complicated part here. And then what, let's say this goes great. They pass everything. They put them all together somehow, and Frankenstein walks over to the Senate, yeah. do we have, do, should we be assuming that that passes when you have J.D. Vance calling this betrayal? Well, I don't think they were counting on J.D. Vance's okay. vote to begin with. Um, but I think that if it basically meets the conditions that um, Senator Schumer and President Biden mm-hmm. want, that they're willing to live with, I think it will pass the Senate. Um, it might take some time because folks like J.D. Vance and others might um, drag it out a bit. But remember, Mm -hmm. in the Senate, you've got more support for this among Republicans than you do in the House. Sure, yes. Although I wonder what happens when there's no border provision in there like that bill that passed the Senate had. But we're 
about to find out, Mike. It's great to have you back. Great to uh, be here. By the way, Mike joined us just as he was coming up for air, editing a story that just hit the terminal. If you want to see what's going on, uh, look at the terminal, Bloomberg.com. Great work as always, Mike. Thank you thank for you. Uh, bringing us inside the process here. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington, where we talk to a lot of politicians. We will later today. That's part of our job to hear from D's and R's, the way they feel about this, what their motives are, and the way they think that it's going to come out. But of course, it's a different conversation when you're talking to an elected official than a true expert in the field. We've been working on a daily basis to try to bring you both. It's our job here to talk to the folks uh, who are representing you in Washington on Capitol Hill. But then there's a voice like Ambassador Ian Kelly, who has served a career in diplomacy and understands the impact that the funding debate has in the real world, what's actually happening on the ground in a place like Ukraine. Ambassador in residence for International Studies and Slavic Languages Literature, Northwestern University, former ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Georgia, and former U.S. ambassador to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for joining. It's great to see you here as we talk about uh, whether we're going to see a vote Saturday, whether it will take weeks or even months to start making the shells and other munitions uh, that this money would help to buy for use in Ukraine. We're also reading stories today about low morale, units that have been waiting uh, weeks, if not months, for ammunition. What is the real impact of this delay in Ukraine? Well, first of all, uh, thanks for having me. And uh, there is a real uh, impact, on, uh, especially on the frontline fighters. They're, uh, they're unable to respond to, uh, to, to Russian artillery because they have to ration uh, their shells in some places. They're, uh, they're outshelled by uh, 10 to 1. Uh, and there's, a, there's kind of a, there's a morale aspect, you know, besides the, the fact that they can't respond as they have been able to. And that's that they have really felt that, they, that uh, the U.S. and NATO had their backs um, but in the last few months, of course, uh, the the bipartisan support, much of it seems to have melted away. And so that it really does affect the, the morale of these uh, of these soldiers on the front line. It affects the morale of of um, of everyday uh, Ukrainians. So there is a real, I think, measurable impact on uh, yeah. on public opinion and on, on the morale of soldiers. The. Reporting I reference in Politico this morning that refers to morale and ammunition shortages, units that have not had a shell to fire in a month, carries the headline, Ambassador, Ukraine is heading for defeat. It says the West's failure to send weapons to Kiev is helping Putin win his war. Some think that maybe he has already won, or I guess a better way to put it is Ukraine may have already lost because of the, the foot dragging here in Washington. Do you agree? Well, it certainly has uh, given aid and comfort to, to Vladimir Putin, the, this uh, uh, months-long knockdown drag-out fight over whether to continue uh, supporting Ukraine. Uh, the, the Ukrainians uh, are very much determined not to allow Putin to take over their country. They've seen what it means to live under occupation uh, in places like Bucha, where uh, dozens of civilians were massacred. So there, there is, I think, quite a determination to continue resisting. Um, but of course, uh, Russia has three times the population of Ukraine, has a much bigger industrial capacity. In the long term, uh, it it doesn't look good unless they have the kind of high technology that we can offer and the kind of industrial capacity that we can offer. So if there is no funding here, if this mechanism that we're looking at now, another swing, another attempt in Washington doesn't work out, Ukraine will lose. We, we can say that out loud, right? I, you know, um, I, I don't think it will end the war. Uh, I mean, even if Russia is able to break through and, uh, and, and take, take territory, we will continue to have a war there because uh, there will hmm. continue to be uh, resistance. Um, I, you know, I, I think an, I, another real um, uh, damage um, that this long drawn out battle has had is 
is we're beginning to look like an unreliable ally to uh, overseas. And we also are also being seen as, as perhaps being willing to let aggression stand if we don't pass this aid. So there's a, just a number of very damaging uh, developments that could come out of this, both to Ukrainians and I think to our own reputation. Well, I wanted to ask you uh, about that very thing. You also serves as a State Department uh, spokesman under Secretary Hillary Clinton. And so I know you appreciate the impact of rhetoric, perception uh, when it comes to international relations. And we've heard this before, Ambassador. We had a conversation with Andre Duda uh, of Poland who told us uh, right here at Bloomberg that a failure in this case to act and, and taking it even a step further uh, to talk about a weakening NATO, for instance, if Donald Trump were reelected, uh, would provoke other countries to consider starting their own nuclear programs. What would be the fallout in Europe specifically among our NATO allies if the U.S. fails to act? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. I, I think that's really kind of an underappreciated uh, you know, result of of this war in Ukraine. The United States and uh, and most NATO allies have withheld, I think, quite a few very necessary weapons like long range artillery and uh, and aviation for fear of uh, provoking uh, Putin from using nuclear weapons. And so the the lesson that a lot of powers draw around the world is if you want to be immune to any kind of uh, concerted Western response. To your, uh, to you know, to to aggression, just have a few nukes, and you will be safe. Uh, you know, no one is going to try and do, uh, you know, to you what the Americans did to uh, Iraq, for example. There won't right. be, yeah. Don't have to worry about regime change. This is a serious issue. I think that really needs to be addressed more. Well, that's pretty scary uh, stuff to consider <laughs> here, Ambassador. Uh, Let's look at the other side of the coin. Let's say this money is passed. Potentially this weekend, we're talking about a Saturday vote in the House. Uh, we have the president's signature in the next week or so. Would the window have closed by the time we can get material to Ukraine? We were told by the administration they were running out of ammo at the end of last year. There are questions about too little, too late. Or could Ukraine use that moment to start pushing back and maybe punch through its lines with Russia? Well, I think we are reaching that point where, um, you know, we won't be able to uh, to provide Ukraine with even the weapons to defend itself. Uh, there was some bridge funding that the Defense Department, Department uh, found, uh, but we're reaching the point where that's going to run out too. Um, but it's there's still time. Uh, I mean, the the time of, um, of war making of uh, campaigning, as they used to say, is in the summer uh, and, and early early fall. So if we can uh, expedite these these weapons to Ukraine, yes, I think that they they could go on the uh, on the offensive, uh, and it certainly would be a blow to uh, to Putin and the narrative that uh, that he's pushing is that all we have to do is wait for the you know the the aid to stop for. Mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine to fall into Russia's hands like a ripe fruit. So his best hope right now, Vladimir Putin's great hope, is that this funding does not pass? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's a, I, I think that they're really, they're really focused on it. Both Russia and Ukraine are very focused on it. A Ukrainian told me the other, the other day that the first yeah. thing that troops do when they wake up in the morning is check their, their, phones to see if the uh, if the funding has passed. And, and I'm sure people in the Kremlin are paying as close attention too for different reasons. Jeez, wow. Ambassador, I'm glad you could join us. Uh, come talk to us again. Ian Kelly, Ambassador in Residence for International Studies at Northwestern University, spent time as U.S. Ambassador to Georgia, as well as the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. The voices of experience you can count on here on Bloomberg Radio. 
You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Breaking news here from Washington. Glad you're joining us on Bloomberg Radio on the satellite and on YouTube. We've got the text. They just dropped the bill a couple of moments ago or bills I should say, having previewed this yesterday, we told you there would be four separate bills, and here they are. I'm looking at an appropriations uh, committee summary of what we've got here. We we have a team pouring through hundreds of pages right now in the newsroom, and there is a lot here. For Israel, the security supplemental totals $26 billion to support Israel in its effort, it says, to defend itself against Iran and its proxies and to reimburse U.S. military operations in response to recent attacks. Four billion alone here to replenish the Iron Dome and David Sling missile defense systems. Ukraine, 60 billion, there it is, just like the president asked for and we saw past the Senate, 60.84 billion to address the conflict in Ukraine and assist our regional partners. It reads 23 of that to replenish defense articles and defense services. Provided to Ukraine, another $11 billion for current U.S. military operations. That's before we send money uh, to Kiev. And then you've got Indopac. This is Taiwan. $8 billion to continue efforts to counter communist China, it says, and ensure strong deterrence in the region. There is a fourth bill that we're hearing about that would include a divest or ban TikTok, that would include the Repo Act, and would also uh, delineate whether this money to Ukraine would come in the form of a loan. I'll let you know when we have our hands on that as we assemble our panel with the news happening before our eyes. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano with us now, Bloomberg Politics contributors. Rick, he managed to get the text out. It came out a lot later than expected, but we're hearing talk of a Saturday vote and a working weekend potentially for the Senate. Can they get this done based on what you see? Yeah, I think that they certainly have the time to do it. It just depends on how hard they want to work and how long into a potential um, uh, Passover holiday uh, week that they're looking at. Uh, You know, and I do think it's going to be close. Uh, You're right. It's not a gimme. Uh, The voting probably won't start until later in the evening on Saturday based on the clock. And and they're going to allow amendments, which I think is generous on the part of the speaker. Uh, which would gum up the process a bit. Uh, That being said, once they finish one bill, that can shoot over to the Senate. They can act on that while they wait for the second bill. So you can create a little bit of a um, a factory warehouse for legislation here and uh, Hmm. hopefully get it done before the stroke of midnight. And I am quite confident that the president would be more than happy to uh, spend the time next week signing these bills one by one uh, since basically it's giving him exactly what he asked for months and months ago. It sure is. Uh, over $95 billion here in foreign aid, Genie, just like the bill that passed the Senate. A lot of conservative Republicans are upset. We don't have border provisions here. There's been talk about adding H.R. 2. Uh, when you step back and look at this, knowing that they could have passed that bill the end of last year, I believe, when it came through the Senate. Remind me on the timeline here, if you will, but it's been some time now. So they're going to get all the money passed for Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, and nothing on the border. Is that right? Is that is that a win for Republicans? Uh, many of them don't think so. And I think they may, I think we should underscore, they may get all that passed. I think the devil here is really in the details and people are right now starting to pour through these details. So we have top line figures, but we have to read down. Are there conditions on the aid for Israel? What is the pay for as it pertains to Ukraine? All of these things are going to matter. But, you know, Mike Johnson getting this out now with the 72 hour rule, he is really up yeah. against it because it is going to be close if these pass and he loses Mike Gallagher on Friday. And of course, If you have Marjorie Taylor Greene and Massey, they just need one more then to discharge and a simple majority to oust him. And you look at the comments by some of the people, you know, that we've heard from even in the Senate today, um, Republicans who we didn't think would vote for the bill, but are sounding this alarm. Then you see how tricky this is going to get for Mike Johnson. So good for him for getting this out. But this is not over by any means right now. And if he wants to hold on to his job, that's still a big question mark. 
Well, we're going to get to that here. By the way, producer James, keeping me honest, this is $95 billion. The final tally on the Biden supplemental was $106 billion. You saw the tweet here from J.D. Vance, Rick. I know that obviously some Republicans are not going to be happy. He calls this a betrayal, though. Rumored course of action on the House is before the text dropped. Combine Ukraine and Israel with other Biden boondoggles, send it to the Senate as a combined package, then let the House vote on a fake border policy package that has no chance. He calls it stupid politics to boot. How many J.D. Vances are there in the Senate? Uh, Yeah, well, there's half a dozen, uh, certainly. Uh, I doubt if not too many more than that. Uh, This is... Yeah. Uh, got, you know, this the, the essence of this bill, as you pointed out, the Senate bill, which was much, much better for conservatives uh, than this current legislation that the speaker is putting down uh, because it had a substantial and maybe historic provision in there for the border. Um, talk yeah. about a missed opportunity historically. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, this is going to pass overwhelmingly. The original bill passed by 70 percent of the Senate. Uh, they're going to have just the same kind of numbers for this bill. Uh, of course, uh, Jeannie's right. Uh, you know, everyone's going to look inside, but uh, these are basically going to be the same titles and the same bills that have been presented already. I believe the difference in the overall number, you know, the president's bill being over 100 million, probably relates to some of the humanitarian funds, uh, which mm. I got to believe Republicans at least had to think about before they stripped it out of the bill potentially, because. You know, at the end of the day, uh, what's missed in all this discussion of missiles flying over the air and whatnot is the humanitarian crisis that exists on the ground there and other places around the world, which would have benefited from these funds. So uh, I hate being a republic on the side of ignoring human rights and 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 humanitarian crises around the world. But that seems to be part of what is going on with the Republican caucus in the House these days. So they strip out humanitarian uh, affairs and they've said no to substantial increases in border security. And so they're basically given Biden a bill that looks much worse than what they would have gotten from the Senate bill. Isn't that remarkable? And Ukraine uh, had to wait a long time for it. It is still waiting, uh, Jeannie. And there are questions about whether it is too late. I guess we're going to find out together here. But Mike Johnson could actually, to your point, lose his job over all of this. I know Marjorie Taylor Greene is making a lot of noise. Tom Massey, he's been here before. Ask John Boehner. Uh, but then there's, you know, there's real question about whether the, the conference has the stomach for this and, of course, whether Democrats will come to Mike Johnson's rescue. And a lot of them say they will. Should he be worried about getting fired this weekend? You know, I I think he has to be concerned about it. We heard him come out yesterday. He, uh, you know, said he is something like a wartime leader, um, you know, talking about the civil war and and how this is how he feels. So we know he's concerned. Um, But, you know, the reality is a part of what we haven't seen yet, and I'm waiting for that fourth bill to drop, and it may have already, is are there any poison pills in here that move the Democrats out of this You know, what they say is, you know, a support provided there's nothing there that would send them in the opposite direction. And that's a big concern, because if Mike Johnson is truly, you know, focused on keeping his job and keeping his caucus together, we might see some of that. And that would be another wrinkle in this. So far, I haven't seen anything like that. I haven't even seen that fourth bill Mm -hmm. yet. But that's something else to watch in the next few minutes, presumably, if that fourth bill comes down. Yeah, we'll keep you posted on that um, as we, uh, if you're just joining us, work through the legislation here on Ukraine, Israel, and the Indo-Pak Taiwan. TikTok bill appears to be uh, not out yet, Jeannie. Bill 4, we're still waiting for text. We'll let you know when we see that. Rick, I'm supposed to ask you if Mike Johnson's going to get fired this weekend, but we don't know that. Does Mike Johnson even know that? Uh, I don't think Mike Johnson has any idea what's in the minds of Marjorie Taylor Greene and some of her buddies. Um, um, you know that that's that's hard to be predictive of 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 that legislator. Uh, but I think you know you described it right. I mean, he's probably got the backing of the Democratic caucus. Probably not exactly what he wants, but it means he's still speaker. I I, I mean, maybe they call the question on the um, on the motion to, to vacate. But I think the vote is going to be overwhelmingly pro Johnson. I don't think the Democrats are going to hang him out to dry like they did McCarthy. And and so we may be talking about this next week. Maybe it's the last thing on the agenda Sunday night. Stay up late, folks. Get the popcorn ready. We could see some fun uh, in the floor of the House. Uh, and 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 yet all that said, 
we'd wake up Monday morning and nothing has changed. Wow. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano in the clutch. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. I am Kaylee alongside Joe in Washington, where... All the lawmakers are as well right now in the House digging through the text of the bill, uh, the three bills, rather, that we just got doing that work just down the street on Capitol Hill. And of course, on the other side of Pennsylvania is usually where you would find President Biden, Joe. But today, that is not where he is. He's not at the White House. He's in Pennsylvania. He's got a bit of an announcement in regard to steel tariffs, I think he's, he's going moving to back. I saw a picture of the a old lot house of time in there. Scranton yesterday. <laughs> this is a three-day tour yep. of God's country uh, for Joe Biden. He's talking tariffs today. He's mm-hmm. actually meeting with uh, with steel workers today, uh, with union workers in Pittsburgh, as he, I guess, tries to match Donald Trump on this one because Donald Trump's ready to slap what was it, sixty percent tariffs. Uh, on here, everything. He's sure. on everything. Yeah. Um, he's, of course, talking about the uh, Nippon Steel deal, mm-hmm. trying to get traction in a group that, frankly, has preferred Donald Trump in the past. Yeah, he's definitely trying to court the union vote on the one hand. On the other hand, Joe, I wonder if this is just more evidence that, frankly, in terms of protectionist policy, mm-hmm. Joe Biden and Donald Trump may be a lot alike because, as you allude to, Trump already, during his administration, imposed tariffs on uh, steel and aluminum. Those didn't go away under Biden. He's kept a lot of these tariffs in place and now is actually thinking about expanding them. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting dichotomy uh, for this president. Of course, he pitches himself as the most union-friendly president mm-hmm. in American history. I suspect that we will hear that later on today. And we should tell our listeners and viewers that we actually expect Joe Biden to be speaking. He's scheduled to start later this hour. We're going to bring you some of his remarks if he gets uh, to it on time uh, and preparing as well to sign these three bills next week, assuming they pass Kaylee. But we wanted to stick on the campaign trail here in this conversation between Joe Biden and Donald Trump with the help of Laura Davison, Bloomberg politics editor, three days in Pennsylvania. While I believe Donald Trump spends four this week in court, Yes, is that right? that's right. That's so he, working out pretty well for the president. It, this is a real nice split screen for him to have. He can go to Pennsylvania, you know, a place he was born there. He's very comfortable and talk to steel workers. You know, when you look at um, both Trump and Biden's um, uh, you know, policies here, they're very close when it comes to uh, when it comes to these policies. Uh, they, you know, both want tariffs. You know, it's important to note that this this policy today is um, much more. Uh, symbolic than it is actual. You know, a lot of the Trump tariffs have already killed a lot of the Chinese mm-hmm. imports. But this is a warning shot to China saying, look, we are going to go after uh, your your shipbuilding industry, your your metal industry. And we've already seen China react and uh, issue a very st- uh, sternly worded uh, response. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as you probably would expect China to. That's typically how things for go, go in this relationship on all matter uh, of issues. Then there's also the consideration here that obviously we spent most of last week talking about the Nippon steel uh, and U.S. steel deal as the the Japanese prime minister was in town at the White House. It, it seems like these policies are all really about the union at the end of the day, right? Sure, there's the national security consideration in there that is often brought up, but really this is a union-friendly president going out to court the union workers. We saw that in the case of the UAW, and now it's the United Steel workers who are maybe getting the special focus, if you will. Yes, I mean, and this is really about courting not just the union worker, but the union voter, mm-hmm. uh, which has been a very powerful, uh, you know, voting uh, organization for for the president going back. You know, you mentioned earlier that he doesn't necessarily have the, the support from the rank and file union member, but he does from the organization. He's gotten endorsements from the United Auto Workers, from the United Steel Workers, and he's gotten a lot of money from them as well. So this is all important, and that the sort of the hope is, okay, if we can have sort of the, the top level endorsement um, and then embrace policies that they like, you know, meeting with them, you know, uh, opposing this deal that would, you know, potentially send jobs overseas. Uh, maybe that's a way to reel in votes. And, you know, in states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, this blue, those blue wall states, Biden really just needs to win, you know, every thousand vote or here or there counts because it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be a $10,000 margin yeah. that small. Mm-hmm. I started by referencing the fact that Donald Trump is in court four days a week. Is this new schedule going to motivate Joe Biden to travel more? over the next six to eight weeks, knowing that Donald Trump cannot? 
This is certainly a key motivation, particularly on those days uh, when when Donald Trump is in court. You've yeah. already seen his strategy in the courtroom start to play out. We saw him go to a bodega yesterday after a court appearance. He, you know, <laughs> got in the car, head uptown. You know, was able to talk about crime and right. and immigration and some of his key you know focuses there. So that's you know you're going to see the sort of the strategy play out as both uh, both Biden and Trump are figuring out you know how can they capture uh, you know the attention of of the media. Yeah. All right, Laura Davison, Bloomberg Politics Editor, thank you so much. Thanks, I got to go back to a bodega this week in New York as well <laughs> you on were my back visit, Joe. I don't miss that much about New York. But the bodegas, kind of though, the bagels, the pizza. No, you look like you're in your element miss. in front of that courthouse, I have to admit. But people forget Joe Biden in the last campaign was doing these drive ins. Yeah. It was the middle of COVID. You had the big white circles, remember, and the people would mm-hmm. honk instead of clapping. This is, in many ways, the first campaign of its kind. Uh, yeah. Very different. The body, the reelection campaign is the more traditional one. Yeah, we're in a very different place now than that's we were sure. four years ago. And certainly that's true as we are now emerged from a pandemic. But mm-hmm. a lot has changed geopolitically as well as there are now two hot wars, European yeah. continent one, in the Middle East, the other. And there's many questions around the path forward for the U.S. Perhaps, though, we got a bit more clarity from Congress today is we do now have the release text of three separate bills that would help fund Ukraine, Israel and the Indo-Pacific We could see a vote in the House on Saturday. The question is, is all this coming just a little bit too late? And that's a question we now pose to Jane Harmon, who is joining us once again here on Bloomberg Television and Radio. She is the chair of the Commission on the National Defense Strategy and, of course, a former congresswoman from California. Congresswoman, always great to have you here on Bloomberg. So assuming that all of this goes according to plan, this passes the House on Saturday. The Senate is able to pass it as well and send it to President Biden. Is it going to actually turn into something tangible for Ukraine just a bit too late? Uh, Well, it is late, but it's not too late. It is um, uh, sooner than it could have been. Uh, But there are a couple of wrinkles here. These are separate bills, and I'm not sure if they're amendable. If they're amendable and there's mischief on the House floor and the dollar numbers change and other baggage is added, it may be hard to reconcile them with the Senate bill. I'm hoping that alongside all of this, uh, there may be some effort at a discharge petition to discharge the exact language of the Senate bill so it can also be voted on. I think it would be passed overwhelmingly and then there would be no conference and this would move to Biden immediately. So I'm not sure where this ends up, but the good news is uh, finally Speaker Johnson figured out he needs to do the right thing and he needs to understand that people are dying in Ukraine right now as we dither. So that's good. I also think Israel needs the aid and obviously we have to send strong signals about defending Taiwan. Um, One other point here uh, that worries me and that is this fourth bill. Where is that going? Uh, I think some Mm -hmm. aspects of it are fine, uh, but some may may be of concern. And finally, the border provisions are not included in the House bill. What an irony. These are the border provisions (laughs) that most members, Republican members of the House want. So why are they leaving them out? Well, that's why I'm getting confused, Jane, and I figure you can help me understand uh, because there was a bill, of course, that passed the Senate. It had everything that we're looking at here, plus an historic compromise between conservative Republicans and I think we can call them centrist Democrats. Go ahead and call them liberals if you want. But my God, yep. Jim Langford was at the table here. Now, I know that the House wanted right. H.R. 2, but that probably wouldn't have worsened the situation at the border. Right. So why, again, was this better than that? Well, uh, it isn't better than that. Uh, but what it is, is it's not it's a way to try not to give President Biden any credit. It's doing the wrong thing so as not to give Biden any credit. And I if that makes sense to you, it doesn't make any sense to me. Sometimes I need to be pulled in off the ledge uh, a little bit here. Uh, but, Kaylee, <laughs> well, Jane well this up is a great just point. happening. If you look Let's at what salute. We heard earlier. Yeah. I, well, I understand. But if you look at comments from J.D. Vance and others, mm-hmm. this even if this goes smoothly in the House, it could get complicated next door. Yeah, especially it is the United States Senate we're talking about where you need unanimous consent to do anything quickly. And there may be some who are very reluctant to allow things to happen in an expeditious manner. Mm -hmm. One of the issues, though, Jane, that J.D. Vance has raised is around repo, which is one of those things that may be in that fourth bill that you were alluding to tied together with a bunch of other things, including the banner divestiture bill of TikTok on this idea of of taking those frozen Russian assets and using it to help fund uh, the war effort in Ukraine. Is this something that is actually 
actually going to work in reality, knowing, frankly, it would need buy-in from other partners in all likelihood, since a lot of this is actually held right. on the continent of Europe? Answer is no, it's not going to work without buy-in from Europe. Most of the seized assets are in Brussels, uh, five billion or so, three to five billion is in the United States, which is not nearly enough money. Uh, and there is an argument, although some lawyers are defending using these seized assets now, there's an argument uh, that it, it could be counterproductive uh, and add to Ukraine's debt and mess up Ukraine's ability to leverage funds from the IMF and other places. Uh, there's another idea about just using interest on these assets, which apparently everybody would agree to, but I don't think it's enough money. At any rate, I, I'm fine with discussing this thing, and I'm fine with uh, some of the other things in this additional package, uh, but what I'm really wanting is the Senate pass bill to be passed in the House so there's no conference, no more mischief, and Biden can sign it on Saturday night. Let's understand, as has been said before, these are the equipment that's going to Ukraine is ready to ship. It's produced in the U.S. The money that we're providing is paying for uh, 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 replenishment of that equipment. In fact, some of that equipment's in Europe. So Ukraine will get relief almost immediately. I was just there two weeks ago, and what I saw was Ukraine is able to produce low-cost drones, uh, more advanced drones, tanks, etc., for its use. It's doing that now, but uh, they don't have advanced anti-jamming equipment, and they don't have air cover. And those are the two things that will help them win the war and help their people from uh, and not die further and help them from shrinking the border. They are, uh, as, uh, as uh, President Zelensky said uh, to our press fairly recently, uh, they're, they're cutting the line, meaning they're reducing the area they're able to defend because they don't have uh, 155 ammo. Imagine that. And they don't have the other things I just mentioned. It's, it's shameful. And thank goodness Speaker Johnson has gotten the message. Well, they're not going to show up uh, anytime soon either. A lot of this stuff needs to be made still after the monies are allocated. Uh, Jane Harmon, if no, you were no, still no, in no. Congress, would you vote to protect Mike Johnson? <laughs> uh, let's see what he does. I would vote to end the chaos. And that's something, that's the call of the Democrats who will have to save him if this ridiculous rules change agreed to by Kevin McCarthy stays in place. I would vote to change the House rules and go back to the, the old way of doing this, where it takes a majority uh, uh, in order to try to remove, the, to vacate the Speaker's uh, office. I think this is in insane. But, but what I'm saying is, uh, you know, it ain't over till it's over. Uh, and let's yeah. see if this goes smoothly this week, and let's see if they hold the Senate numbers, and let's see if there's a possibility of actually passing uh, the Senate bill in the House through a discharge petition or some other uh, procedural change. It's not, it's not what Johnson is recommending right now, uh, but just maybe some Republicans will step up and help sign this discharge petition, and that will get legs, and that would save us all and save the Ukrainians uh, from a lot more uh, tragedy. Jane, just given how difficult this effort was, considering this effort still is not over, knowing we're getting closer and closer to an election and there is no end in sight for this war between Ukraine and Russia. Is this going to be the last opportunity for the U.S. to provide aid? Is this not going to only get harder as this conflict goes on? It's going to get harder. And as the election uh, season uh, increases and, and the dif disinformation by Russia, uh, you know, which is influencing some members of Congress, increases and Ukraine's position weakens. Uh, I can see an argument, well, they, you know, they can't do it, so let's, let's focus elsewhere. I, I think that is heinous and shameful. And let's understand that if Putin wins in Ukraine, he moves right on into Europe. He's basically said that. And it emboldens China with respect to, you, to uh, Taiwan. Uh, and it emboldens Iran with respect to the Middle East, where it is not abiding by any rules. The world is... Uh, as messy as it has ever been, U.S. leadership is needed ma more than ever. If Ronald Reagan were alive, he would be talking about just what I'm talking about, which is robust support uh, uh, for freedom in the world against these enemies who want autocracy and want to take away freedom for their citizens and for all the rest of us. Always great to have time with you, Jane. We thank you. Jane Harmon, chair of the Commission on the National Defense Strategy, of course, former Congresswoman 
With straight talk today from our nation's capital, I'm Joe Matthew. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lyons in the Capitol. We've had quite a bit of breaking news since we came to air less than two hours ago with text released on three spending bills, Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. We're waiting for a fourth now, or at least details. We know that uh, it's in uh, it's in the formulation here. We'll likely include a TikTok divest or ban measure. Kaylee, they're talking about the Repo Act, mm-hmm. which would actually help to pay uh, for uh, Ukraine funding by way of seized Russian assets. Uh, and there could be Iran sanctions in there as well. Now, instead of one big vote like we saw in the Senate, this yep. is going to be four separate votes in an assembly line, I think is how Rick Davis uh, talked about this. In a best-case scenario, you pass it in the House, you get it going immediately in the Senate. Otherwise, they're going to take a lot of time. Of course, this vote isn't going to happen until Saturday at the earliest because members need 72 hours to read all these various pieces of legislation. So that is definitely true for our next guest, Republican Congressman from North Dakota, Kelly Armstrong, is joining us now live from Capitol Hill. So, Congressman, I'm not sure how in-depth you've been able to get into the text of this legislation yet, but from the headlines, from the outline that we have gotten, the reaction we're seeing already from some of your colleagues, is this going to work? Will the rule pass? Uh, I don't know. I don't think we have enough Republican votes for the rule, just from what I can follow from my colleagues uh, on social media right now. But I I mean, the speakers made the play. Uh, We're going to move forward. I think the problem with how our rule votes have gone so so far this Congress is it's a little bit like skipping school. It's hardest the first time, gets a little easier the second time, and now we're there. But I mean, we'll get we'll get our first answer in the rules committee and then we'll see when we get on the floor. Well, okay, Uh, got it. Your your own impressions though congressman i'd love to hear because these three bills that we've seen at least look a heck of a lot like uh two-thirds of the senate bill that passed and i know is considered doa in the house what we do not see here is any language on the border and i know that many conservative republicans thought that did not go far enough but to have nothing uh in this package is this a raw deal for republicans well, I think the border is the number one issue in every district across the country. I think it's the number one issue I hear from my constituents. Sounds like they're going to bring a second rule with a second border bill. But, I mean, we're going to have an open amendment process, which I think is important. I can, you can fully expect to see some pay for amendments uh, from conservatives here. But, again, it all comes down to what, what the rule looks like, what the actual underlying text is. We're going through it in my office right now. And then so you have threefold. You've got to give everybody a chance to read it. You got to have an opp- You got to pass the rule. You have that opportunity for amendments, and then I guess a fourth one. We got to keep everybody here until Saturday night. Yeah, and I guess there's a question of not just whether or not people will be in town through Saturday, which does indeed appear uh, will happen, but frankly, what would happen after the votes are actually cast, specifically to the Speaker himself. Congressman Mike Johnson obviously is facing now a motion to vacate threat, not just from your colleague from Georgia, Marjorie Taylor Greene, but Tom Massey, potentially others, could move against him as well. Are we about to see history repeat itself? What are the odds right now that he falls to the same fate as Kevin McCarthy did those months ago? Well, I don't... Yeah, I mean, I don't know so much about odds, but I know math. I mean, by the end of, by probably Monday of next week, we're going to have a one vote majority for a short period of time until some of these specials come around and we get Ohio back in here and California back in here. And so if two people bring it, I mean, I just, I would, I would tell each and every one of my colleagues, I went through that 15 week thing in October. I don't think anybody for as good as Mike, or as hard as Mike is trying and for as good a man as he is, I'm not sure anybody thinks it's better now. And more importantly, I'm not really entirely sure on our side who would take the job if this works again. Well, uh, that is part of the problem here, although we understand Tom Emmer might be uh, in the running if it gets that far. And God knows the majority whip has a lot of work to do here uh, over the coming days. One thing that did take place in the House that we can actually uh, get our arms around, Congressman, is the impeachment of the Homeland Security Secretary, Alejandro Mayorkas, who was back in your House of Representatives Uh, to testify to the president's budget proposal yesterday. The articles of impeachment uh, have been sent over to the Senate where we're told there will be no trial, uh, that this will be quickly dismissed or die a quick death through some legislative maneuver. 
after the time that you spent in the House on this, what's your message to senators? Well, I think a lot of the senators on my side of the aisle would like a robust debate. I mean, Secretary Mayorkas has made a conscious decision not to follow U.S. law that has directly impacted people as far away as the state of North Dakota. Um, but, I mean, I, I take a different view of this. We can't ever control what the Senate does. They can't control what we do. The best we can do is do our work. I think Mark Chairman Green did a great job of laying out the reasons why this is important. We give it over to them, and I wish they would take it and give it the gravitas it deserves. But again, I can't control what happens over there. Well, and even, sir, if you were to see the Senate impeach Mayorkas, which I think we all know is is highly unlikely to happen at this point, what reason do you have to believe that a future Biden administration Homeland Security secretary would do anything differently? The administration's policy wouldn't change just because one secretary was impeached. Well, I, I mean, and that was always the debate on our side as well. And I think for the most part, that is exactly accurate. Your point is, is the person who's in charge is who you go after. But I think in this specific case is somebody who's worked on the immigration subcommittee since I got here in Congress in 2018 and actually did this work as a lawyer before I got here. When you make a conscious effort and, and specific efforts as the secretary of, uh, of that agency to not follow the law, it's worthy of that. You know, we've heard a lot about it. It's first time it's happened in over 100 years, well, uh, I would argue that this is the worst secretary we've had in over 100 years. Well, as the Mayorkas impeachment resolves uh, in the Senate here, Congressman, there's the matter of uh, Joe Biden's impeachment proceedings, not in a formal sense, but the hearings that have been uh, underway. He has chosen not to accept uh, Oversight Chair Jim Comer's invitation to testify, and in the letter uh, letting him know that the White House special counsel said your impeachment investigation is over. Is the White House right? Yeah, they, I mean, they're, no, I don't think they are right. I think that's the letter your lawyer writes. I used to write those lawyers to, or letters to opposing lawyers as well. Eventually, Chairman Jordan and Chairman Comer are going to have to make a decision. The one difference about these investigations versus the way they work out in a court system is you run up against a time clock. They're going to continue to try and get this. I still think we should be working very hard to get the audio from special uh, prosecutor hers, uh, President Biden talking to his ghostwriter. I think all of those things. But eventually, they're going to have to say, do we continue to fight for this information or do we wrap it up, write a report and let the Republican conference make a decision? And that's a chairman decision based on the time clock. Congressman, of course, as there is much to discuss in terms of domestic politics, including our own borders, there is a lot happening geopolitically, which is what a lot of this legislation that has been uh, introduced, at least the text of uh, today, is meant to address the various wars we are seeing that U.S. allies are engaged in, including in the Middle East, as we're still awaiting a potential response from Israel uh, in retaliation for the strike we saw Iran conduct over this past weekend. I'm wondering how concerned you are, knowing that you sit on the Energy and Commerce Committee, about what may happen in the Middle East and what the ramifications of that could be on energy prices and and other things. What is your degree of concern? Well, my first degree of concern is with our closest ally, maybe not just in the region, but in the world, is Israel and their right to defend themselves against, uh, surrounded by hundreds of millions of people that, quite frankly, want to wipe them off the planet. But I mean, just coming into this break before my segment, you had WTI down two, $2 a barrel. Uh, at any other time in history, if there was a hot war with Russia and a conflict in the Middle East, I think it's safe to say that oil would be over $110 a barrel at this point. It is not. And the reason for that is because of American oil and gas production and shale plays like in my state in North Dakota. So my longer term actual concern on the energy prices is a, 16, a pause on 16 LNG exports, a tailpipe emission, clean air acts that are coming through out of this administration, which I, I mean, we're producing as much oil in North Dakota as we ever have. But these are long term subsequent problems that will, de will decrease our ability to produce and transport oil and natural gas in five years, seven years. And it seems like a conscious effort from this administration to do just that. Well, it's an interesting time to be talking here, uh, Congressman, and we appreciate you being so generous with your time. After this is done, whether this is an up or down on Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, this is sort of uh, a fit of lawmaking that we're going to see potentially here in the next couple of days. Because it's a campaign year, because of how thin the Republican majority is in the House, are we done after this? Is the store closed? 
Well, I hope not. I hope we can get a farm bill done. It's incredibly important to the citizens in North Dakota. We're going to start, obviously, the 2025 appropriations process. But, I mean, you all know this. I mean, this isn't unique to 2024. The massive legislation always slows down the closer you get to an election. But um, we're going to, I mean, when we get through this set of things, I know our office is going to be concentrating on figuring out how to get a farm bill across the finish line. It's an important reminder that there is still work to be That's done. Sure. I guess there's a question of how expeditiously uh, that can happen. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us here on Bloomberg Television and Radio. We appreciate your time today, sir. That was the Republican congressman from North Dakota, Kelly Armstrong. And of course, Joe, it's not likely that we're going to see votes on the farm bill for some time as it took yeah. just this long to figure out the supplemental question around funding for allies. And that vote will happen on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And I guess we'll see what happens to Mike Johnson as a consequence. Well, that's for sure. And it's, you know, the farm bill, of course, it, it's not a shocker for the at-large representative of North Dakota to bring that up. But it's, yeah. of course, uh, involving a lot more than agriculture with the vast majority of funding in the farm bill going to food stamps. Yeah. That's how the SNAP uh, program is funded. So uh, that's an across the board uh, sort of impact when it comes to cities, when it comes to farmlands across the country. And boy, we've barely started talking about that. This is day to day, or in the case of today, hour to hour here, yeah. Kaylee. We still don't have a fourth bill yet, do we? No, not at this point. We'll wait for the text of that. We know likely what is going to be in that, but we're still parsing through all of the details here. So thank you for joining us as we do so from here yeah. in Washington. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.